We've seen that when two ideal gases mix within an isolated system, there's a dispersal of the kinetic energy of both ideal gases over the entirety of the system. And we mentioned that we can think of the second law as this idea that for isolated systems, the dispersal of energy characterizes all allowed spontaneous processes. But to put a quantitative spin on that notion, we'd like to define a new state function that captures energy dispersal. And the state function that does the job is one that's called entropy, which is denoted with the letter S. In this video, we'll look at the classical definition of entropy, talk about a conceptual idea for what entropy represents, and do a simple calculation for an entropy change for a process we've seen already. So let's dive into entropy, which gives us a deeper appreciation for the nature of the chemical potential. What we've already seen is that spontaneous mixing of these red and blue gases within this isolated system causes a dispersal of energy, more specifically, the kinetic energy of all of these particles bouncing around within the container moves from concentrated within each of the two boxes to dispersed over the entire container. The state function entropy, or S, captures the extent of this energy dispersal or disorder for a chemical system. Really, it does for any thermodynamic system, but we'll focus on chemical systems in particular. The units of entropy are energy per temperature. So in particular, it's the amount of energy dispersed at a particular temperature that's the entropy. And we're noticing, at least in this case, that for the spontaneous process of two ideal gases mixing within an isolated system, delta S is greater than zero. So in the ideal gas example, it should be pretty clear that energy dispersal is going on. The particles spread out to fill the entire container and the kinetic energies that are associated with or attached to those particles disperse over the entire volume of the container. But let's think about how other spontaneous processes also involve increases in entropy. Consider the example of a ball falling to the ground. As we mentioned before, as the ball falls, its kinetic energy is converted into potential energy. And so initially, when the ball is not moving, it has some quantity of potential energy. At the moment before it strikes the ground, all of that potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy. But of course, eventually, after maybe some bouncing, the ball comes to rest on the ground. So what happened then to the potential energy that the ball had when it was above the ground and the kinetic energy that it had the moment before it struck the ground? Where did that energy go? According to the first law, energy is conserved, and so the energy of the ball falling to the ground must have gone somewhere, right? Well, what we know is that the energy is converted into heat and sound when the ball comes to rest. And that heat energy, that thermal energy, and the sound are dispersed throughout the room in which the ball is sitting. The entropy change for this process is just the energy dispersed, for example, the positive potential energy, divided by the temperature T at which this process is occurring. This is how we think of entropy change. It's the amount of energy dispersed that has units of energy divided by the temperature at which the dispersal is occurring, T. Consider a more chemically relevant example, the example of ice melting in a warm room. Energy transfer from the warmer air molecules to the ice is spontaneous. What we can say is that the energy that's concentrated in the warm room disperses to the cooler ice, which has less energy, spontaneously. In general, then, the change in entropy delta S is related to the amount of energy dispersed, which will denote Q rev, at a specific temperature. This definition of the amount of energy dispersed as Q rev deserves a little bit of comment. For one thing, the Q is meant to evoke heat. We're thinking of energy dispersed as heat when we talk about entropy. The second piece here is the rev subscript, and that is meant to deliberately evoke reversible. Heat is a path function, right? So if we're going to relate entropy, which we've defined at least for the moment as a state function, we'll see why it's actually a state function a little bit later, but if we're going to define entropy as a state function, then we need to put conditions on the energy or the heat dispersed, and we need to know something about the path involved. In particular, for entropy, we define the energy dispersed as the heat dispersed for a reversible process. The specific temperature T 
should be measured in kelvins, by the way. This is the definition of entropy. Delta S is equal to Q rev divided by T. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the infinitesimal level, which we saw in the video series on the first law. This also holds at the infinitesimal level. So a very, very teeny, teeny, tiny change in entropy is equal to a teeny, tiny reversible heat divided by the temperature at which that reversible heat transfer occurs. And dividing by the temperature is important when thinking about entropy because dispersed energy makes a bigger impact in low temperature situations. Here's an analogy that can help us understand this idea. Consider a soccer stadium versus a symphony hall. The soccer stadium is very loud and raucous. The symphony hall, very quiet and subdued. Think about the impact that loud cheering makes in both situations. Loud cheering makes a much larger impact in a quiet symphony hall than in a raucous soccer stadium. If the level of cheering is the same, it's going to have a much bigger impact in the quieter symphony hall than it will have in the loud and already raucous soccer arena. This is why we divide by temperature. The soccer stadium is like a high temperature system for which energy dispersal doesn't have much of an impact, so delta S is relatively low. But in a quiet symphony hall, a low temperature environment, the same amount of energy dispersed is going to have a large impact, and delta S will be large. Let's think about calculating delta S for an example of a process that we've seen before, a phase change. If we conduct the phase change reversibly, there's some heat transfer involved delta H. These are the delta H's, for example, of fusion and vaporization that we've seen already. We've also seen in the video on heating curves that the temperature of the system remains constant throughout. So we can simply say that delta S for a phase transition is equal to delta H for that phase transition divided by the temperature at which it occurs. To give you a specific example of this, delta S for vaporization, for example, is equal to delta H for vaporization, the enthalpy of vaporization, divided by the temperature at which the phase transition occurs, which for vaporization is simply the boiling point. Let's think about whether this definition of entropy change makes sense. Boiling is endothermic, so Q rev is greater than zero and delta S is greater than zero. That means energy is dispersed within the chemical system in the course of boiling. Does this make sense? Well, let's think about on the molecular level what the liquid and gas phases look like. In the liquid phase, there's some random dispersal of the water molecules, but not much, especially in comparison to the gas phase where the water molecules are now separated by a large distance, very spread out, and moving with relatively large kinetic energy. This does indeed require an input of heat and the heat that is input to cause this boiling becomes dispersed over a larger volume, certainly, as the liquid evaporates to gas. So this should make sense. Freezing is exothermic, and in this case, the system releases heat and the entropy change is less than zero, indicating that energy, in a sense, is concentrated within the system of water molecules. Does this make sense? Well, in this case, we're going from the condensed liquid phase with somewhat random orientations of water molecules to a more well-structured phase in which the water molecules have frozen into ice and formed a regular crystal lattice like this. In a sense, we're concentrating the energy. There's a little bit of kinetic energy, for example, that these water molecules have in the liquid phase. We're concentrating some of that to form this regular crystal lattice, slowing the molecules down and forming a regular pattern of water molecules in the ice that's present after freezing. So this should make sense as well, that for freezing, which is an exothermic process, the system is releasing heat, and in fact you can think of the system dispersing heat within the surroundings, while its own energy is becoming more concentrated. We can also think about calculating delta S for the isothermal compressions that we saw previously. Consider our old friend, the ideal gas inside a chamber capped with a movable piston. What's delta S for compression of the gas from V1 to V2 isothermally, that is with no change in temperature? Well, to begin thinking about this, remember that de first of all, delta S is equal to Q rev divided by T. And actually in a previous video, we already looked at how to calculate Q rev. 
Remember, Q rev was equal to the negative of the reversible work in this case, since delta U is zero, since internal energy depends only on temperature for our ideal gas, and the change in temperature is zero. Starting from that foundation then, we can apply the same idea at the infinitesimal level, and that's what I do here, and then substitute in for del W rev, negative P dV. And so del Q rev, the infinitesimal reversible heat, is equal to positive P dV, which is equal to nRT over V dV, just using the ideal gas law to substitute in here. We can then plug in this infinitesimal reversible heat into this integral for the change in entropy, where we're just adding up all the infinitesimal changes in entropy ds, which is del q rev divided by t. We arrive at the change in entropy is equal to n times r, which is a constant, times the natural log of v2 over v1. And you'll notice that this is very similar to the expression for the reversible heat that we derived before. It's just missing the factor of t, because in the definition of entropy, we divide by t. And so delta S for this process is N times R times the natural log of V2 over V1. And for this compression process, V2 is less than V1. And so we should expect delta S to be less than zero, right? That should make sense. We're compressing the system and concentrating the kinetic energy of the ideal gas particles into a smaller volume. 